Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's online drought meeting. Uh, my name is Rebecca Vidito, and I am one of the ISU Extension Field Agronomists. I'm over in East Central Iowa. Um, I'm going to be your host today. And before we kick things off with our first speaker, I do just have a few housekeeping things. And then just kind of a quick overview here. Um, we're going to start off first on the livestock side with Chris Clark. Um, and then we'll transition to Tim Christensen, our farm management specialist, to talk about farm management considerations. And then we'll have Aaron Sogling, our field agronomist, talk about stuff on the uh, agronomy side of things. And then we'll end with Charlie to talk about grain quality expect expectations. So with that, I'm going to have Chris pull up his slides and get started. So we're going to talk here about managing livestock in a drought and feeding some of these drought stress crops and forages. Um, just wanted to start here with a quick picture of the most recently updated drought monitor map of Iowa. So this was released August 18th, so last Thursday. Um, I think we have had some spotty rains and storms in the meantime. Uh, it'll be updated again this Thursday based on rainfall as of, as of today. Uh, but you can see there's that pocket in Northwest Iowa that's pretty dry and has been for some time. And then we've got kind of this gradually worsening uh, band of, of drought kind of across South Central and even up into Central Iowa now. So that's kind of where we're at as of, as of current conditions. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is nitrates in crops and forages. And this comes up every year that we experience some degree of drought stress. Uh, drought slows or prevents the conversion of nitrates to amino acids and proteins. And so we then get nitrate accumulation in the plant. We think about this quite a bit with corn and part of the greater risk with corn is just from the greater fertilization rates, but we can see nitrate accumulation in summer annuals such as sorghums and Sudan grasses. Uh, we can also see it in various weeds, cereal grain plants and cover crops as well. And so nitrates can be toxic to animals, um, particularly ruminants. Um, those nitrates can ultimately disrupt the animal's ability to carry oxygen. So you can see a whole slew of different symptoms and clinical signs just kind of related to that lack of oxygen. So this is kind of a description here of the relative distribution of nitrate nitrogen in the corn plants. And the take home message here is that we see a greater concentration of nitrates in the lower part of the stock. Uh, this is from the University of Wisconsin, and it kind of breaks it down based on um, what part of the stock uh, we're looking at, and then even looks at, at leaves and ears. You can see there's very little nitrate in the leaves and ears and in the upper part of the stock, um, and significantly greater concentration of nitrate nitrogen in that lower one third of the corn stock. This kind of drives one of our management recommendations that if we cut silage from drought stressed corn, we may wanna raise the chopper and actually leave the bottom 12 to 18 inches of stock in the field. And we'll talk about that more here in just a moment. So there are some tests that can be done for nitrates. Uh, this is kind of demonstrating here a quick test or a field screening test. Uh, many of the agronomists and beef specialists have uh, this solution of diphenylamine and sulfuric acid and distilled water. And we just take corn stalks, we split the stock and put drops of the solution on the split stock, starting at the bottom and kind of working up toward the ear. A color change to uh, blue, black, dark purple, anything along those lines, that would indicate the presence of nitrates. Um, probably at or above somewhere around 4,000 parts per million. Now it's a very qualitative test. It's kind of a yes or no, looking for the presence of nitrates. If we see indication of nitrates with that color change, then we really need to follow up and try to look at nitrate concentrations. <clears throat> to do that, we'd like to submit samples to the ISU Diagnostic Lab or to another laboratory. Many of the commercial labs that do forage testing will also do nitrate uh, concentration testing. Uh, <clears throat> one of the tricks to this, one of the really important aspects to this is getting a representative sample. And then we wanna play pay really close attention to how the results are reported. So this slide uh, shows a graph from an Iowa Beef Center fact sheet. It's uh, IBC 50, it's about nitrate toxicity done several years ago by Dr. Inslee and, and Dr. Barnhart. 
as you can see here, we've got three different forms of nitrate reported. Okay, so sometimes labs will report as potassium nitrate, sometimes as nitrate nitrogen, and sometimes simply as nitrate ions. Okay, and then we've got these feeding recommendations based on the concentrations of nitrate in the feed. So if we just compare these two right here, let's compare nitrate to nitrate nitrogen. For nitrate, anything above about 10,000 parts per million is considered dangerous and we probably don't wanna feed it. We're on a different scale if we look at nitrate nitrogen. And over here, anything above 2,300 parts per million is considered dangerous and we would recommend not feeding it. And so you can see it becomes really important to know what form of nitrate we're talking about and kind of how your results are reported from the laboratory. So some general strategies here for feeding drought stressed corn. Um, obviously, based on the last few slides, I would recommend testing for nitrates. You kind of have to think through whether we want to test, um, you know, right at harvest out of the field uh, or whether we want to test like after uh, in siling and maybe prior to feed out. I think you definitely want to test up front, especially if we're going to green chop or if we're doing any grazing or trying to bale dry hay, uh, because those are greater risk for nitrate toxicity because you don't have the, the opportunity to kind of reduce the nitrate levels. We generally recommend harvesting uh, drought stressed corn as corn silage. The fermentation process, the ensiling process can reduce those nitrate levels by quite a bit. Some resources will say by 30 to 60%, some will say even up to 80%, but you can see a significant reduction in nitrate levels with the fermentation process of ensiling. Now that being said, I think it becomes really important to make good quality silage to optimize that fermentation. We've got lots of resources on the Iowa Beef Center website about making good silage. To me, it comes down to typically two main things. Um, first, let's harvest at the proper moisture level. And then second, let's really do our best to eliminate oxygen, which means to pack well, to cover, to seal up those bags really well, whatever that case might be. <clears throat> so some strategies here for feeding silage from drought stressed corn. And so when we're harvesting that silage, one thing we wanna do is to make sure we don't cut it or harvest it immediately after a rain. Nitrates are water soluble, and often you see quite an influx of water and nitrates into the plant after a rain. Uh, typically, we want to allow about seven to 10 days then for the plant to process those nitrates and for some of that nitrate and water to leach back out. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we then want to think about cutting a little bit higher than normal. We want to try to leave the lower third of that corn stalk in the field, and that would be the part with the most nitrate concentration. So interestingly, when you do that, you'll get lesser yield, but actually greater nutritional value um, on a percentage basis because we're leaving the more undigestible part of the plant uh, unharvested. If we do have to feed silage from drought stressed corn, we know we have some higher nitrate levels. Uh, one thing to consider is to, to think about testing water as well for nitrates because nitrates are cumulative. We have to think about kind of consumption per head per day. And so, uh, testing water can be a good idea. We can dilute out the nitrates by mixing with other feeds and, and feeding that nitrate, um, that high nitrate feed is just a component of a diet mixed with, with other feeds and forages. We can try to introduce slowly and gradually to let them get a little bit adapted to it. And then we can feed to the most tolerant cattle. So some of the, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the charts that show, <coughs> uh, excuse me again, some of the charts that show feeding recommendations based on nitrate levels go into more detail. And for various different levels, they might say, well, um, don't include this as more than 50% of the total ration or uh, go ahead and feed to maybe feedlot cattle, but not to breeding cattle. And so those are, those are some of the things we can think about there. Generally breeding cattle and lightweight cattle would be the most susceptible and your heavier feedlot cattle would be the most tolerant. So what about nutritional value? When we think about silage from this drought stressed corn, um, you know, if we get past the nitrate issue, uh, it's worth a, a brief discussion of, of feeding value. And I always recommend doing a nutritional analysis. Um, I think we would generally like to see more producers do more nutritional analyses, um, even in normal years, but certainly in a drought year, it can be helpful. 
the drought stressed corn will tend to have less starch in the ear and kernel, but will have more sugars in the stock. And so interestingly, um, silage from drought stressed corn can be surprisingly good uh, in terms of feed value, sometimes up to you know, near 90% of the feed value of regular corns, uh, corn silage. <clears throat> this kind of breaks that out. Um, we just got a chart here showing kind of a description in the left-hand column of the corn and then feeding value in the right-hand column as an estimated percentage of normal silage. And so stressed all summer, um, no ears and stunted growth can be 70 to 80% the feeding value of normal silage. Severely stressed with even really minimal yield can be even up to 80 to 90% the value of normal silage. And then with just moderate stress or, or just stress during pollination, we can get up um, upwards of 90% the feeding value of normal silage. <clears throat> so some other kind of bigger picture things to think about here, um, things we can do to stretch the drought stressed pastures. So Obviously, pastures are, are pretty stressed, pretty overgrazed, pretty, uh, pretty dormant in many cases right now. And so what are some things we can do to stretch those pastures? And we'll talk just very briefly about strategic culling, early weaning, and supplementation. So <clears throat> strategic culling is just finding those cows that um, would be our first choices to, to cull since feed is going to be potentially scarce. And so it might be a good fall to preg check early, find those open and late bred cows and go ahead and market them. Um, and then any problem cows, whether it be bad udders, lameness, bad teeth, disposition problems, if you haven't already culled those, this would be kind of an opportune time to do that. Early weaning can be a good management option here, which can minimize cow energy requirements by 30 to 40%. It will also minimize um, protein requirements as well. It can also just reduce your grazing pressure on your pasture. You, know, you figure if you've got 13, 1400 pound cows with let's say 400 pound calves at side, um, those calves are grazing in addition to suckling. And so just by removing them from the pasture, we can reduce that grazing pressure. So for early weaning, you probably tend to have the best success with, with calves that are at least 90 days of age. And so we're shooting for maybe 90 to 120 days of age um, but I would say those calves at that age are still more susceptible to respiratory disease and stress as compared to calves that would be weaned at, let's say, 200 days of age. So I think it's really important to think about minimizing stress, going through the preconditioning process, acclimating them to their feed prior to weaning. Keep in mind then we're weaning in a warmer environment, a warmer season than if we were weaning in October, November. So we need to think about managing dust and flies. We need to think about offering shade. And then water is really, really important, especially on these warmer days uh, for these weaned calves. I've come to believe that dehydration and shrink are really strong um, risk factors for developing disease. And it's just gonna be critical that we have plenty of fresh, clean water available and that the calves know kind of where to find that water. The other thing to think about is the height of the waterer. If we're weaning lighter weight and younger calves, we need to make sure that they can reach the waterer. <clears throat> Feed selection here uh, needs to be palatable, nutritious, and economical. Um, we can help you with rations for early weaned calves, but a couple general recommendations. Typically that protein level needs to be 14 to 18% crude protein, maybe even a touch higher depending on age and weight at weaning. Generally speaking, a third of that diet would be high quality forage, and then about two thirds would be concentrate, and this is on a dry matter basis. And then work with a nutritionist or an extension specialist to make sure that we balance those rations well and really kind of optimize um, what we're feeding. So if pastures are short, consider early weaning, and then we can also consider supplementing. And so that can be a variety of different feeds. Typically, we don't see a reduction in forage consumption from the pasture until we get to a supplementation rate of about 1% of body weight. And even then it's not pound for pound displacement. Um, we sometimes think of it as maybe like a half to three quarters of a pound reduction in forage intake for every pound of supplemental feed uh, fed per head per day. So 
with that in mind, um, there, there may be instances where we need to go even further and could totally remove them from pasture. And we'll, we'll mention that in a moment. But for supplementation, we do have a variety of feed options. Uh, I like to look at that on a price per unit of nutrient. So I've got a little spreadsheet that I like to use that helps me find price per unit of energy, price per unit of protein, and it helps kind of compare apples to apples. <clears throat> so if pastures are really short, we then want to consider early weaning again, but we may have to go a step further and think about a sacrifice paddock or a dry lot and then feeding those cows, whether it be hay, silage, total mixed rations, uh, whatever kind of works in your operation. This hopefully will allow the pasture some recovery time uh, as we head into winter. A couple quick notes on other potential cow feeds for winter feeding uh, as we move into uh, the fall and winter. So obviously we get emergency release of CRP for haying and grazing if we get to a certain degree of drought stress. Uh, keep in mind that that forage can be variable uh, depending on the species that are there. And it can also be pretty mature considering we're not harvesting until early August. So it tends to be a pretty low quality forage. Corn stalks are another thing to think about. Uh, they can be a valuable feedstuff uh, when supplemented appropriately. Again, there I think about the nitrate risk. And so you have to think a little bit about whether you're baling or grazing and what that risk might be. So if baling, I think you have to think about how much of the lower stock you're trying to incorporate into the bales and then how you're gonna feed that, will a cattle be able to sort or not um, and things like that. In previous drought years, we've talked a lot among the Iowa Beef Center staff about the risk when grazing. And I think the general consensus is the risk is relatively low for grazing corn socks, just given the selectivity um, that, that cattle graze with. And so they're gonna first look for the grain and the husk and the leaf and then maybe some upper stock and some cob, they're gonna get through most of the goody before they start focusing on the lower part of the stock. And so I think if we manage it appropriately and if we don't overgraze um, corn stock residue fields, we can probably graze corn stocks with relatively low risk for nitrate toxicity. A couple general recommendations for stretching feed supplies, uh, test feeds and forages, I work on minimizing waste, both storage loss and feeding waste. Um, utilize the silage from drought stressed corn if you can. And so I'll turn it over here in a moment to the farm management specialist and they can speak to this better than I, but <clears throat> there may be instances where you can go ahead and, and work with your insurance representative, um, your, your crop insurance adjuster and get some insurance payment, but also be able to salvage some of that as silage to be used for feed. And so, uh, when you do that, it can really help kind of offset the maybe decreased yield from hay during a drought year and the loss of pasture productivity and stuff like that. Work with professionals to balance those rations well and then keep an eye on body condition scores. Some additional challenges that I will, will note here and I just don't have time to address them all today, but certainly in a drought year, year we can have some heat stress. We can have exacerbation of fescue toxicosis we can have blue-green algae blooms that can pose some to toxicity risk. Uh, we can have some greater exposure to toxic plants, um, whether it be fescue or weeds or whatever, um, just secondary to overgrazing. And then we can also have some risk for mycotoxins. So in some drought years, we get enough heat and humidity and stuff where the environment's right for aspergillus. And so we have some risk there for aflatoxin. And I think maybe there'll be some mention of that by some, some speakers here in a few moments. <clears throat> I'll leave you with a couple things here. This is a, a picture of the Iowa map and kind of mentions all of our regional beef specialists and our contact information. And then we've got uh, Beth Reynolds also from campus who helps with uh, programming and consultation across the state. So feel free to reach out to us. We can help with recommendations and rations and things like that. And then this would be a link to our drought resources page on the Iowa Beef Center website. Um, and it's loaded with good information and lots of different resources about uh, managing through a drought. And so with that, I'll open it up to any questions you might have. Thanks, Chris. So if anybody has any specific questions um, for Chris, feel free to type them in the chat box. And if you also notice in the chat box, um, there's a variety of different resources 
getting uh, put in there as well. So be sure to check those out. Um, well, I think we're maybe waiting to see if there's any questions coming in, coming in, Chris. A couple of questions I jotted down that I know we sometimes get. Um, you mentioned uh, the sorghum or uh, sorghum sedan as having a concern potentially for nitrates. Um, what about millets as well? Do they have as much of a concern? Yeah, I would include those in that list. I think many of those summer annuals, um, uh, including the millets, would be at risk. Uh, same kind of deal, probably more of an issue um, when we fertilized heavily and more of an issue in the lower part of the plant. And so there may be some options to kind of manage that depending on how we manage harvest and grazing. But uh, I would still be somewhat concerned there. Thanks, Chris. Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions right now. Um, so if anybody has any questions, um, type them in, but we're gonna move on and have Tim Christensen, our farm management specialist uh, go now and he's gonna talk more on the farm management side. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Like I said, I'm Tim Christensen, a farm management specialist. Uh, and you can see my contact information there and I'll have it again at the end of my presentation if you have any questions. Um, I cover the southwest corner of the state, so you can kind of see the map there. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me from anywhere in the state, but you can call your local county extension office and get in contact with a kind of farm management specialist in your area uh, to answer any specific questions to your area. Um, so I guess the number one question I get in these times of year is just what should I do? Uh, what should an insured farmer do once a crop loss is recognized? So it's always a good reminder that um, if you have a crop loss um, issue, you have 72 hours to report that to your agent. Um, but that's more of a hail, a wind, that kind of damage. Um, in a drought situation, you have 15 days um, after the end of your insurance period, which would be harvest. So um, the biggest thing here is just talking to your insurance agent if you think you have a problem out there, making sure uh, you're connecting with them. Um, if you have some hail, wind, something other that you think caused some damage, go ahead and give them a call and make sure they're aware of it. They can send an adjuster out. Um, you do need to continue to care for that crop. Um, and uh, Chris approved earlier. Um, the last thing you want to go is go out and start chopping and uh, destroying the crop, doing anything with that crop before you talk to your insurance company. It's quite likely your insurance company will let you chop silage, but they may ask you to leave some test strips um, to go back for yield verification those type of things. So make sure you're working with your insurance um, provider um, and understanding what their needs are to make sure you can still go ahead and collect insurance on those. Uh, some considerations for drought. Um, I think we need to be doing some yield estimates for our marketing strategies. If we pre-harvest harvest, pre -harvest marketed some of the grain, uh, making sure we're going to have bushels to cover those contracts and, and discussing that with our um, grain retailers that we have those contracts uh, and if we think we're going to be short kind of talking about what uh, strategies we might have there um, maybe you're going to have more grain than you have marketed already if you do some yield estimates and you can go ahead and market some more grain than maybe you thought you should uh, but getting out there in the field and, and pulling some errors and, and getting some estimate on what those yields are um, is an important thing to be doing this time of year um, especially the livestock producers need to be thinking about their feed needs and what, what do they need for corn? Um, is there gonna be enough out there to fill those needs? Are they gonna to have to purchase some additional corn? There might be some marketing opportunities um, to take advantage of that now. Uh, really, I think the crop farmers need to understand um, what insurance type they have. Uh, ma majority of Iowa farmers have multi peril revenue insurance. So it's based off of a revenue level. Um, but you need to make sure you know what you have and what level you bought between 60 and 85%. Have a really good understanding of that. Um, what your APH is on those fields. Are you in optional units or enterprise units? Which means are you, are you uh, doing your crop insurance by the field? Or are you putting all the fields in one county together? Um, a year like this where um, these droughts sometimes uh, are spotty and, and one area gets some rains and we have some better yields and down the road a mile, we miss the rain and the yields are struggling. Um, if you're in enterprise units, that can be uh, um, 
a bad thing or not a bad thing, but they could hurt you if you have too many bushels in your other field in the same county. It's, it's based off all of the same thing. Um, obviously, the optional units, when you do it by field, cost more um, for your premium. So it's a balancing act. Uh, but understanding those APHs, understanding what kind of insurance you have. Um, the insurance prices are based off the February average or the October average, the higher of the two. Uh, so these are the February averages are guaranteed um, price is 590 on beans and 1433 on soybeans. So uh, we'll we'll keep this uh, Chicago Board of Trade average through October. If those come out higher, those will be adjusted up. But we know the minimum what those prices are going to be. So we can kind of look at um, if we get some yield estimates out there and we can compare it to our APH, we can kind of start looking at what some insurance um, claims might look like. But um, the hardest thing about the drought is uh, from a financial standpoint, really, until the combines are out there and we have actual yields, um, there's not a whole lot we can do, but uh, kind of have an idea of what we're looking at is good. Um, I think stock quality can become an issue in years like this, and I think we need to start thinking about our harvest strategy, uh, making sure we're getting into those fields that are having some stock quality issues first, um, getting those out of the field before they go down and create some additional problems. Um, another thing I think uh, some people forget about or maybe aren't aware of is if you have any grain quality issues, those have to be addressed in the field. So if you do have a microtoxin, test weight, some other type of grain quality issue, there is some help there through your crop insurance, as long as you identify that way the crop's still in the field. If you harvest the crop, put it in a bin, move it off the farm and, and, and uh figure out that there's quality issues later, uh, there's not gonna be any help for you on an insurance standpoint there. So um, even if you're storing some of this grain on your bin, being really aware, paying attention to what the quality of that grain is, as it coming out of the field is really important. And if you notice there's some quality issues there, getting that tested and contacting your insurance agent uh, could be the difference between being able to collect on insurance for that quality issue and not. Um, some other continuations, uh, considerations that adjusters will be busy. Uh, there's lots of uh, large areas. Chris showed us a large area, large area affected by drought. So the adjusters will be going to be busy. The sooner you notify them and get after you get done with your harvest, the sooner an adjuster can get out there, the sooner you'll be on the list. Um, insurance companies cannot defer payment to the next tax year, but sometimes if they're really busy and there's a lot of adjustment, a lot of uh, claims out there, the adjusters might not get to there till late in the year and it may not be paid out till the following year. And there's always the question on tax about de deferring these. Um, taxpayers using the cash method in the income year uh, counting cash accounting system, uh, they can defer up to half of that insurance payment into the following harvest as long as um, they have been deferring to the crop in the past. So uh, if you're using the accrual method, you cannot defer the crop and the insurance payments. So make sure you're talking with the, if you're expecting um, a crop insurance claim and, and you're concerned about deferring some of that, make sure you're talking with your tax accountants and whoever's helping you prepare your taxes to understand how that's going to affect you um, directly. Um, I was looking for a map, never did find one, but Chris mentioned uh, emergency haying and grazing. This is the list from the FSA office. Um, you can see there of counties that are under, uh, there's 12 counties there, or uh, 27 counties there that are approved for emergency hay and grazing, 12 counties with the restricted emergency hay and grazing. Um, the important thing here to note too is, is that uh, um, you can't just turn, open the gate and turn the cows out. You need to be talking with FSA. The, depending on what program you're in could affect um, how many days, stocking rates, um, whether you can or cannot um, graze these, some of them restrict uh, permanent water sources and you have to fence off 20 feet around those. Just depending on what program you are, there are some different rules. So before you um, turn the cows out uh, and start grazing an area or, or fire up the baler and, and start uh, wrapping up some bales, make sure you're in contact with your FSA, make sure everything's in line and, and there isn't going to be any long-term repercussions um, to your CRP uh, program. So if you talk to FSA, you are part of one of these counties, you're in a program that is allowed, it doesn't affect your payment any. 
Um, it doesn't affect anything in the contract and you can go ahead and take, uh, take advantage of that. So uh, talk to your FSA agent before you take advantage of the emergency haying and grazing. So uh, like I said, there's not a lot for me to talk about until after we find out exactly what the yields are gonna be. Uh, so my presentation is fairly short today, but some real key takeaways I want you to talk take home with you today is talking to your crop insurance agents early and often. If you think you're going to have a claim, be in contact with them. Make sure that they're you're on their list. Um, anytime things change, uh, let them know and make sure they're part of uh, the decisions you're making this fall to make sure that uh, you don't do anything to uh, jeopardize those insurance payments. You know, and understanding what insurance products you have, um, knowing knowing what your APHs are, what percentage you are, understanding how that works, so you can kind of anticipate what a payment might look like. Um, like I said, adjusting your marketing strategies as needed, and and all in all, it's just keeping good records on a field by field basis. Um, I think it's always a good idea anyway, uh, but just a, a good reminder of that. So I always like to, to put in here, you know, drought and other things or things out of our control and sometimes can um, increase the stress level on the Iowa farmer. So I always just like to, to remind everybody of the Iowa Concerns Hotline. Um, the numbers started in 1985. It's the last four numbers. Um, write that number down. If it's uh, if people are there available 24 seven, it's free, it's confidential. They can talk to you about all kinds of stress related concerns. Uh, and even if this isn't something that uh, um, is affecting you, you may have friends, neighbors, community members, other people that could be affected by this. So I encourage everybody to write that number down, save it in your phone, um, have it somewhere handy. So if you, you come across somebody in your communities that's, that's having a hard time, um, that we can get them some help. So with all that, uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Once again, here's my contact information, but if you're outside of my area, you're happy to contact me. Uh, welcome to contact me and I'd be happy to discuss these things or there's also other farm management specialists in your area. Thanks, Chris, or excuse me, thanks, Tim. Uh, if anybody has any questions for Tim on the farm management side, feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, Tim, some questions or question for you on the um, FSA with the haying and grazing. Are there any deadlines that people need to be aware of for that? Yeah, depending on what program you're in, um, uh, September 1st is a deadline for getting signed up on a lot of that. So getting in there sooner there's, rather than later is better. And a lot of those have an ending deadline of the end of September where the animals have to be off or the hay and grazing has to be done. So it's a fairly short window where you're allowed to graze. So you wanna make sure um, you can take advantage of that full window. So the sooner the better, uh, but talk to your FSA and, and see what, like I said, there's, there's so many different CRP contracts now, it's hard to make a general statement on any of them. But talk to your FSA office if you have CRP and see what program you're in and what the restrictions are, but the sooner the better. Thanks. And I think maybe in some counties, the uh, um, haying deadline might even be the end of this month. So um, definitely be sure yeah. that you are talking to FSA. Um, the yeah. other question I had for you, Tim, is um, are there any resources you would recommend on the Egg Decision Maker website, like spreadsheets or anything that might be helpful for people? Um, there's several, and I can put them in the chat box while Aaron's talking. There's a, there's a few different kind of walking through some spreadsheets on crop insurance once you know your products to know what your revenue guarantee is and how that's figured. Um, but Ag Decision Maker is a great resource to go to for those things. And I'll, I'll put a few of those specific articles into the chat box while Chris is speaking, or why Aaron's speaking, sorry. And yes, I misspoke. I said September 1st. I meant August 31st is the deadline. You have to have it done by September 1st. So. Yeah, by the end of this month, you need to be in contact with your FSA office, but I would recommend um, doing it today if it's something you think you're interested in. Thanks, Tim. So with that, we're going to switch gears and talk more on the crops or the agronomy side of things. And so I'm going to pass it off to my counterpart, Aaron Stogling, who is a field agronomist in Southwest Iowa. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for joining us. Um, and I'll just kind of go through some basic crop production things. Uh, at this point, uh, it's very difficult to make any 
uh, management decisions uh, this late in the game, uh, but we'll go over a few things to just kind of keep in mind. Um, so there's a picture of the drought monitor, obviously. Um, as field agronomists, uh, we have input on this uh, on a weekly basis throughout the growing season. So sometimes you'll see this line shift or move or change. Um, as Rebecca pointed out, I'm in Southwest Iowa. Um, and so it's relatively accurate, um, depending on where you are. I would say Pottawatomie County, parts of that in the north are probably a little drier. Um, but this is uh, something that you can have available uh, if you would like to look at it. Just uh, kind of a quick overview. Uh, we'll look at the impact on crops. Uh, the three that we'll focus on essentially is going to be corn, uh, soybeans, and then some forage uh, information. Uh, soil fertility, I, I think that's something that's not talked about quite frequently uh, after a drought year. Um, there are some things that we need to have in consideration with high commodity prices, high soil uh, fertility input costs. Um, these are things that we need to keep in mind. And then also a few things, uh, we've got a lot of traction this last several years and uh, the adoption of cover crops, uh, particularly in Southwest Iowa's other parts mm -hmm. of the state. And there are some things um, that you're gonna wanna consider uh, related to that. So when we look at uh, impact, corn in particular, uh, th this impacts when you have a lack of moisture, um, growth and development of the corn plant in particular. While early on in the growing season, um, this can be beneficial for corn. I think uh, a lot of folks uh, reap those rewards last year uh, because of the rooting ability of the corn crop. Uh, if it's a drier May and June or April, depending on your planting date, um, those roots tend to go deeper into the soil profile uh, and can benefit you later uh, as the crop dries out. Um, and so the other thing that it can be a negative is uh, temperature. And so you should be looking at a slide there uh, that talks a little bit about temperature on the left-hand side. And you can see as we move along in growth stages uh, on the top part of that um, in particular that you can see uh, our uh, water usage uh, increases dramatically. Um, in 2020, in southwest Iowa, we were extremely uh, dry in July and August, very similar to this year. Uh, the thing that is noticeably different this year is our air temperatures uh, were much greater uh, this season, and that definitely impacts corn uh, in uh, the uh, time frame that we're talking about. So there's just a couple of bullet points, uh, reiterates what I've already verbally shared with you. Um, so you can kind of see uh, that's what we've got. And I think most people that are uh, farming uh, understand that and they've watched that develop in their corn crop uh, throughout the growing season this year. So is it is it too late for corn if it's still alive? Uh, I, I will never turn down a rain um, until you get uh, far into the growing season. Uh, obviously, there are fields out there that it is uh, probably too late or portions of a field. I will say that it's probably too late to add additional rain yield at this point. Uh, but there's several other fields that uh, a rain would still be beneficial uh, as long as that plant is alive. So what it does do is that the kernel number, uh, that's already set. Um, the kernel size and weight is not set. And so that is where additional rainfall uh, can help you at some point uh, in particular. So uh, those of you that have been out uh, and breaking ears, um, you've kind of seen where you're at in terms of growth stage in crop. Uh, the general consensus on a lot of fields I've looked at in Southwest Iowa, uh, we have good kernel numbers. Uh, the problem is, is they're extremely shallow. Um, and so we have very shallow kernels um, and that is gonna lead to some challenges uh, I'll talk about in just a minute um, when it comes to harvest in particular. Low yield potential uh, silage. Um, this is some information from Wisconsin. It talked about the extremely uh, dry conditions, and I think these are going to be more applicable to portions of a field um, or, you know, poor soils on certain farms. Uh, if you do decide to chop them for silage, um, then uh, we want to take that into consideration. Obviously, that those uh, yield potentials are going to be significantly lower. This is what I talked about a little bit before. Uh, tip back. Uh, this is extremely uh, something I looked at a lot of fields in that July time frame as we were pollinating this year, maybe a little bit later because of our delayed planting season this year. Uh, the ear is tipping back, um, and that's simply where we just abort kernels on the tip of the ear. Um, the picture on the left-hand side you can see is obviously maturity-wise is a little bit farther along, uh, but you can see 
Um, a lot of those kernels are uh, tip back. They won't develop properly. Um, and that can cause a little bit of challenge in terms of shelling that uh, cob and getting the rest of those kernels off the tip um, and whether they're gonna be beneficial or not. Zippering, uh, this is another issue uh, that we run into in drought conditions uh, where you miss entire kernels or portions of a kernel. Um, and that is, uh, like I talked before, that is kernel abortion. And so those kernels simply aborted. Uh, more often than not, um, from extremely high temperatures um, and probably, you know, two, three, four days of high temperatures with uh, large moisture stress. So if you experience moisture stress at pollination in particular, which depending on where you were in Southwest Iowa or other parts of Iowa, Plymouth County, um, that probably occurred uh, right when you were really needing some moisture. And so uh, you'll get these zipper years uh, in particular. Nitrogen deficiency, fertility deficiencies, uh, those also play into that. Um, hybrid, uh, some hybrids are probably going to be more susceptible to this than others, um, depending on if you had insect damage, uh, the lack of silking, or if you had silk clipping caused by insects or any other phenomenon uh, will also uh, relate to causing some of this zippering here uh, that we have. So when we look at estimating corn yields, uh, or corn loss. Um, these are just some general rules of thumb. Uh, there's a lot of variability in this, um, but what you do not typically want to have happen is to go fast through the growth stages. Um, and that's exactly what has happened in 2022. We accelerated a lot of those growth stages. We are all familiar with growing degree days. Um, and the faster that those growing degree days accumulate, that tells me that we had hot temperatures. And so we want to be closer to the average or we want to slow down that process, particularly uh, during the grain fill time frame for, for us in Iowa. That is going to be any time from July through virtually right now, the middle part of August, depending on the mm -hmm. part of the state that you're in. So um, speed of maturity, like I said, a one to three percent yield change per day. Um, so if you start accumulating those that had drought stress for the last 30 days, um, you can get a, a number uh, in particular. So moisture stress, leaf rolling. Um, I am in the uh, subscription that early leaf rolling in corn in the early vegetative stages prior to uh, V5, V6, um, maybe is not as detrimental to yield as some agronomists will tell you. Uh, but as we get later in the growing season, the late vegetative stages uh, in particular, and we get to the reproductive stages, uh, tasseling and the early part, stages, uh, this is a lot more detrimental uh, to yield in particular. And then I've already uh, talked a little bit about heat stress. So leaf rolling uh, during the week of silking, like I talked about, uh, four hours, uh, that's about a 1% yield reduction. So those of you that were out driving around in the afternoons uh, when it was 99 degrees or we had 110 degree heat index, um, you can start to look at your calendar or do some uh, farmer math and kind of figure out uh, where you're at uh, relative to that. The morning, uh, we've seen a lot of times where that corn plant had the ability to respire overnight and it actually um, slowed down and looked a little better in the morning, but as we got the hot temperatures, um, it de definitely uh, reduced yield. So here's what I talked about basically in uh, accumulation uh, in particular. So the first three days in a row, uh, 93 degrees, plus don't see a lot of loss, um, provided there is some moisture available. Um, we had some areas where uh, there was probably not any uh, plant available moisture. Um, and so those uh, cases probably had a little bit more loss than this. Um, and so as you get into days four, five, and six, um, then you can kind of see it's a compounding effect, 2%, um, 4%. Um, these are just some general guidelines uh, in terms of uh, stress, we know how stress affects corn, uh, but the hybrid or the genetic package, the plant available moisture, uh, the soil profile that you have, tillage practices all play a role uh, in this. And that's why I think you'll see a fair amount of variability uh, this year in terms of yield as you go across your fields. As Tim pointed out, um, estimating corn yields, um, these are just some things in terms of you can find these charts. They're available through extension. Uh, a lot of the seed corn uh, folks can do this. And so you're going to know how many ears 
uh, that you want to collect. So when it comes to estimating corn yield, I think the best thing to do is to, to grab a five gallon bucket or something and go measure off a section uh, in a portion of your field. So for most people in 30 inch rows, 17 and a half feet and uh, hand harvest uh, the ears that you consider harvestable ears. Um, and so then you'll get a number uh, of ears that you've collected. You can count the rows around and then the kernels per row. And so the misnomer when uh, hand estimating yield is uh, how many kernels do we calculate per bushel? Uh, I've seen all kinds of numbers thrown around. Um, I will tell you based on the kernels that I've seen this year and the kernel depth, they're extremely small. Uh, I would say at a minimum, you wanna use 90 to 100. A thousand if you're using this formula to calculate corn yields. Um, there's no 100% accurate way to do that, uh, but I think you'll be a lot closer in the ballpark uh, than 90 or I've seen 88,000 used to be a common number on some of the uh, spreadsheets when you're calculating it by hand. Um, but uh, 100 is probably going to be a closer number for those of you that are, are pretty affected by uh, drought. Other potential issues uh, received several calls. Uh, related to corn aphids in particular this year, uh, spider mites. Uh, at this point uh, in the game, it's very difficult uh, to make those management decisions and you're simply gonna have to take that on a field by field basis. Um, I can't speak to other parts of the state. I can tell you in Southwest Iowa, most of our crop is pretty well advanced uh, that I probably wouldn't use any insecticide applications on insects this late uh, in corn. Um, soybeans are a little bit different discussion um, as you get into the R, what we'll call the R5.5 stage, that's a pod set uh, to the top portion of the plant. Um, you may have an argument that uh, if you have spider mite infestations, uh, that we might want to consider that uh, in particular when it's, uh, when it's related to soybeans. Uh, harvest combine setting is important. Um, be aware of that. Um, and smaller ears are going to be a little bit harder to do that. So your snapping rolls on your head, you may need to adjust those in particular. Um, you may have to speed up or slow down uh, fan speed on the combine in particular. Uh, you may have to increase or decrease, excuse me, your concave clearance uh, setting to collect a lot of those uh, smaller kernels. Be sensitive of moisture type. Um, sometimes in a drought, we, we may think it's not uh, we may think it's a little farther along than what it actually is. And so we want to make sure that we're harvesting grain in an acceptable moisture level in particular. So stock quality uh, will be an issue. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Typically in a dry year, uh, we've heard the term, it does cannibalize portions of the stock and put that uh, input into the plant itself. And so prioritize that. Uh, keep in mind with that. Eardrop can be a problem. Uh, the shanks tend to be a little bit smaller. And so as we increase harvest speed, um, we may um, shatter those ears or when we snapping rolls, uh, grab those, those ears tend to bounce. Um, and so we may have more ear loss uh, in the field and just be sensitive to that uh, when you're setting your header speed. Soybean yields, uh, I've always said that they've been made in August. Other agronomists have seen that. Uh, as well. And so we've kind of kicked the can down the road the month of July uh, as it's been dry saying, well, you know, if we could just get a rain. Well, uh, in a large portion of Southwest Iowa, that did not occur um, or where it did occur. Uh, we had smaller amounts of rainfall and, and others on here may have experienced the same thing. Um, like I talked about, that pod filling stage is that R5 to R6. Um, and once we get to R6, that tells us the plant is starting to die uh, a majority of the pods are turning brown, and so they are basically senescing um, and will no longer benefit uh, from accumulation. <laughs> All right, um, spider mites, I talked a little bit about that. Uh, same thing there with combine adjustments. Uh, those with draper heads obviously are going to be a, a little bit of an advantage over the traditional drum reel, um, just because of how they feed into the machine. Um, and so there um, are some settings there to just be sensitive of. Soybeans as a forage, we frequently get this question. Um, this is not for the faint of heart. Uh, I have seen it done before. Um, it's very difficult to make real palatable forage related to this. Um, if you have specific questions um, in terms of using this as forage, I would urge you to, um, 
visit with an extension field agronomist or someone who's had experience doing this in the past. Um, also uh, check with your insurance company. Um, this might be for the individual that for whatever reason has a field of beans uh, that, was, that are not insured. Um, and so that may be an option. Also look at uh, what your feed needs are or your resources are. Um, we're gonna essentially treat this like silage. Uh, the difficult thing with this is cutting soybeans as a forage. It's extremely difficult to get them to dry. Um, and if you don't treat them properly um, in terms of uh, they probably need to be wrapped, it's very difficult to make it dry, dry hay, I'll call it. Um, you're probably going to need to wrap them and make some type of silage uh, related to that. The biggest thing I think for most folks that will kick this out, um, most pesticide labels uh, for most soybeans uh, probably are going to prohibit you from using these as a forage. And so please be aware of what your herbicide program was and whether it's even acceptable uh, to do that. And so that would be a violation of the label, uh, irregardless of whether we think it would uh, hurt the livestock, it would be a violation of the label. Pastures and forages, um, obviously if you're in a drought, most of these are already overgrazed. Uh, a lot of them would be dormant. Um, we have cool season grasses and the majority of them would be dormant um, with the exception if you had some legumes in a pasture um, that would be uh, related to that. So supplemental feeding, Chris talked a little bit about that uh, in particular. Uh, alfalfa is the question I've been getting here this month. Uh, a lot of people are looking at either third cutting or fourth cutting. Um, what should we do with it? Um, I'm in the opinion that if it's extremely dry and I have some of those areas where it's less than 10 inches, I would probably just leave it alone. Um, we may have to just leave it uh, and not take that fourth cutting. That's very difficult uh, because most people are short in terms of forage. Um, so you'll have to make your decision on whether you can sacrifice that alfalfa stand next year or not. Um, if you're willing to run the risk of uh, winter kill and killing that alfalfa stand over the winter uh, because it doesn't have enough growth to uh, maintain carbohydrate reserves in the root system, uh, then you can probably go ahead and cut it. If you're not willing to risk it, um, then you're probably going to want to approach that with a fair amount of caution. Here's water use by alfalfa. We can kind of see the same thing. Uh, we would be out here in this time frame. Uh, three weeks after the third cutting, you're looking at about a quarter of an inch uh, per day. Um, so to put that in perspective, uh, you would need an inch or actually need more than that. You probably need about an inch and a half to two inches of rain uh, per week, which we're currently not uh, receiving. So it, it's going to take a fair amount of moisture uh, for that to recover. We want to rest them in the fall. Uh, do the best you can. Chris, Chris alluded to this. Um, if you can at all um, keep those cattle confined and sacrifice a smaller portion of your pasture, um, I think uh, the long-term survivability of those forages is gonna be much better. Um, if you don't have a dry lot opportunity, uh, some poly wire and electric fence can help you contain those uh, livestock or cattle, particularly um, to a certain portion of the pasture um, and sacrifice that. I would encourage you to find places that are easily uh, to renovate, obviously, so they have topography that allows field equipment on there. So if you do need to go in uh, here and you can um, uh, fix that um, or regenerate it, uh, that's probably what you want to do. Grass pasture uh, nitrogen use. Uh, we are going into a cooler temperature time frame as we get into late August, first part of September. Um, so if it's not uh, completely dormant, uh, you can get some additional productivity. I would be cautious on the nitrogen rate, probably somewhere in that 30 to 40 pound range um, is going to be what you want to look at. This would also be a time if you wanted to include some weed control, uh, might be an option uh, as well to do that. And so um, you can include those two uh, at the same time. Uh, phosphorus and potassium. Um, probably not going to get much good as dry as, as it is right now to apply broadcast dry. Um, those applications um, may want to be better utilized, uh, particularly uh, next spring or over the winter period. The only uh, difference to that would be is if it was an alfalfa field uh, that you know that you need some potassium applied, uh, I would consider applying that potassium now um, and give it ability to get a rainfall here uh, over the fall uh, and into the soil profile and that will help 
uh, those plants uh, survive some winter kill uh, if that's possible. Soil fertility, um, we understand that when you have dry conditions, uh, a lot of those uh, P and Ks that uh, we're trying to measure for, in particular, uh, those numbers tend to be uh, lower. Um, potassium is the one that's probably the one that sticks out the most. So if you look at uh, potassium samples this year, when you're making fertility decisions, uh, those numbers are probably going to be lower. Um, most people are going to not change their soil sampling. Uh, time frame, but just make a note uh, that when you pull those, if it's been extremely dry and we don't get any rainfall here in the next three to four months uh, of the summer time frame, uh, that those are going to be uh, impacted as well. Cover crops um, need rain to germinate. Uh, depending on where you are, um, this is something I would tell you you're probably going to need to make sure that there is some soil moisture uh, that you can get the germination process started. Uh, or obviously those seeds, if they're shallow, uh, if you're broadcasting, um, the success rate is going to be greatly diminished. Um, if you're drilling into the soil profile, uh, it does have the ability that there may be some moisture there, depending on your individual farm need. Um, so I think this is something that you definitely want to keep in mind. The other thing is, uh, please be vigilant in terms of knowing what active ingredients or herbicides that you applied in the year of 2022 um, for a couple different reasons. One, we may stay dry. If that's the case, that may cause us issues next year as you develop small grains, maybe you're planting soybeans, understand what those dates are. Um, if you're concerned about the cover crops that you're planting, especially if you're using uh, anything other than cereal rye, cereal rye or small grains tend to be a little more tolerant of a lot of the herbicides that we use here in Iowa. You can actually go out, take a shovel, take a lick tub uh, and put some soil in that and plant, uh, plant those cover crops, even if you just toss them out by hand um, and kind of water them in and just kind of see, and you can do this a couple of weeks before your intended cover crop to kind of see what kind of response you get. Um, it is just kind of a quick visual uh, but it will definitely help you um, get an assessment of whether you think that that could be um, something to consider. Going into next year, 2023, um, if you're in extremely dry uh, areas, and we have some of those in Iowa this year, um, I would be a little bit cautious about planting a cover crop going to corn the following year. Uh, that's something that we need to uh, think about in the future. We can't predict the future in terms of weather um, but think something that we want to think about um, that may impact our corn crop in 2022. Just to kind of summarize a couple of things, uh, the impact of the 22 weather on crops will be quite variable. Uh, I expect to see that. Uh, carryover is always variable. Should that be an issue? Not saying it's going to be an issue in 2023, uh, but that's something that happens. I think you're going to see a lot of variable yields uh, as I've traveled uh, a good portion of the state. Uh, that's what we're seeing. I think you'll see that in the yield monitors. Uh, I think you'll see that in your yield maps uh, when we get later into the fall and we have the ability to kind of analyze uh, what this crop uh, did for us in 2022. So harvest can have some special challenges in terms of especially corn. I think trying to get those small kernels shelled off uh, the cob is going to be a little bit of a challenge. So um, feel free, you may have to make adjustments uh, in the field um, or as you move from field to field uh, in particular. Um, also do the push test on corn stalks um, when you're out there kind of pushing over on some stalks to see if you may have some harvest uh, issues related to that. Forages, uh, be sensitive to that. Uh, know the risk, uh, especially of alfalfa going into fall. Um, and uh, spend some time, scout your pastures. Um, take a ride on an ATV and, and kind of see what you have uh, in terms of what's dormant. Uh, what species that you have out there. And uh, this is a great time where uh, winter annuals in particular and biennial weeds become problems in pastures uh, in the future. So we may have a huge weed problem two years from now uh, from the drought of 2022 and a lot of pasture management. Soil sampling, uh, in a best case scenario, you, you would want to wait for some uh, measurable precipitation. Uh, we may not have the ability to do that depending on who does your soil sampling. Uh, but please take into consideration that you have a pretty good idea of what date 
the samples will take in, uh, and then you can look back in time and see when the last time that field was in, received measurable precipitation. Um, and you might have to tweak your soil fertility recommendations uh, going into 2023. Like I said before, uh, this is the Extension Field Agronomist team. And so um, I cover Southwest Iowa. Um, and so you can reach out to me, you can reach out to anyone in your local area uh, should you have questions related to that. Um, I'm gonna kick it back over to Rebecca. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box now or uh, I'll be around at the end. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, so while we have uh, Charlie Herberg getting his slides up here, um, one question that I do have for you, Aaron, is I know as field agronomists, we will get uh, questions about um, after a drought, do we need to adjust our nitrogen rates at, going into the following year? So what comments would you maybe make on that a little bit? You know, obviously we know that um, a large precipitation event or large precipitation events will help mineralize nitrogen that was left over in the soil this year, but maybe wasn't utilized. The, the challenge with that becomes is it's very unpredictable, I, I guess, to, to make those decisions uh, at this point. So for folks that are applying fall anhydrous, we're probably not gonna see a lot of measurable rainfall. So I don't think I would lower my fall nitrogen rate um, those folks that are on a spring nitrogen management system, maybe a side dress type system, uh, they might be able to capitalize and utilize that in the spring of 2023 and uh, kind of use, you know, a mid-season nitrate test. Uh, if you're comfortable doing those, that would give you a better indicator. Uh, but as far as fall management right now, I probably would not change a lot. The other one is on, on soybeans. Uh, we beat this horse to death. Uh, traditionally, we, we, we're just going to take 40 bushel credit and, and that's what we're going to take for nitrogen. And the reason for that is, is because it's mostly in the leaves. All right. And, and so once those leaves drop, it doesn't matter if they're 70 bushel beans or they're 40 bushel beans. For the most part, uh, they had about the same amount of leaves. Now we have some ultra early soybeans that go in. That tend to get a little bit more vegetative um, but without taking some soil assays to know where we're at in terms of soil nitrate in the spring of 2023 it's kind of hard to make those uh, correlations now thanks aaron and so with that um, we're going to have charlie herberg um, who's our last presenter today uh, talk about possibilities for grain quality as we head into the fall so charlie it is all yours if you want to unmute uh, yourself here. I just did, there we go. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, about rain quality, recognizing that this is completely a predictive exercise and it's often wrong. Uh, boy, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we might, based on our experiences in previous years, what we might expect. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, what we might expect for, uh, for grain quality given the persistent drought through the year. Uh, I have to put a caveat in here. As I, 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 those of you who have heard me before know that I have spent as much time explaining why the advanced prediction before uh, maturity was wrong as it is when it was, as it is when it was right. Uh, and that is, that is true of grain quality. Grain quality is determined at the end of the growing season. And so uh, pretty much, pretty much uh, at the late grain fill and then after, as you start to dry down, that's generally where the grain quality is determined and, it, and it's a little tough. And you can have some rather radical uh, changes because of the weather conditions. I, I give you one example here. Uh, I think most of you remember the uh, derecho storm of, of August 2020. And the day after, this line, the uh, immature, wet, moldy, mycotoxins, low test weight, that was, those were the watch words of the day. Those were, and I was in that camp too, that, that these, this was what we were going to see as, uh, as, as grain quality through the year or through the harvest season. Now, the reality was and this is the pictures on the bottom are the various types of, they were scored by Megan, uh, the various types of uh, damaged corn from the storm. 
And the top, up at the top, were uh, samples collected by the crop specialist from fields of the various scores. And you'd think that, well, surely, for sure, that flat one, uh, that ought to be junk, basically. Uh, and on down through the others as well, showing some sort of damage. Well, it didn't. And the reason was that we got a month or two of very pleasant, warm weather with adequate rainfall after the storm. And that completely changed the aspect of, of what happened. The proteins were reasonably normal. Test weight, that's where I figured. I, uh, if any of you heard me talk after the derecho storm, I said, well, we, anything under 45 pounds per bushel, let's not put it in a bin. Uh, we didn't have a single sample that was below 50. Uh, and most of them were in what I would call the normal or average range. So uh, the the point being that uh, the point being that that previous or advanced predictions on grain quality particularly, which is the impacts of things are not so cumulative, um, you got to be take them with a grain of salt. Uh, let's look to, to get some idea of what we might see. I wanted to look at some of the previous droughts, or the recent previous droughts, and what happened. Uh, the, of course, the, the uh, uh, feeling or the general belief is we'll have low test weight, we'll probably have toxin problems, mycotoxin problems in, in uh, droughted areas. Uh, I'm going to show a little bit about what the previous droughts did. Uh, this was 2020. And, at, and this was on September 8th, so right after Labor Day, we had a pretty good area, bigger than this year, uh, a pretty good area of the red level D3, and then uh, obviously a larger area of the other, of the next one, the D2. So we had about 40% was either two or three, uh, and about 15% was in the area number two. And there were some areas that were yellow or even or even uh, no drought impact at all. Grain quality, as it turns out, and the data here is basically from IDELS, uh, who did a survey, who do a survey every fall of grain quality, particularly from the mycotoxin perspective, but the samples are, we, we were able to use them for other things as well. Obviously the yield was lower. Uh, test weight was actually higher in the droughted areas and certainly not below average in the storm damaged area, proteins were higher in the drought, droughted areas, lower, so, somewhat lower in the storm damage. Uh, these, this, the protein higher has to do with small kernels and more germ, more germ fraction as opposed to the starch fraction. Test weight, I think one of you already mentioned, uh, you can get more BBs than basketballs in the cup. And so as long as the grain is reasonably well uh, filled, you end up with higher test weights uh, in, in droughted areas by virtue of smaller kernels. That can be a, a little deceptive in the, along the way. And starch, of course, would be the reverse of protein. Uh, soybeans had lower yields because of small seeds um, and, and low protein. Drought stress, I think it was mentioned before, drought is tough on protein in soybeans. Uh, because it, the protein is distributed throughout the seed and the biosynthesis is not as great. So, um, so proteins were kind of tough in 2020, uh, below the normal. Here's 2012. Whoa, 2012 was much more of a drought than, than we have this year, and it was much more of a drought than we had in 2020. We had one area right here that was actually in the very far severe uh, a portion. It turns out that same area happens to be the one that is the most severe uh, this year. But you can see that the, the severity was greater and the, and the coverage of severe areas was uh, also uh, higher. The IDAL survey, again, uh, came up with much the same answer in that uh, essentially the grain matured reasonably well. It still wasn't drought enough to kill it before it had time to reach maturity. Rather, the seeds were small and the yields were low, it still reached maturity. Protein was higher, test weight was higher, yields yes, low. 
This time we had enough heat and then a little bit of moisture at the end of the season to create some aflatoxin in Southwest Iowa. And that's always the fear of a droughted, of a droughted crop is that we would get typically aflatoxin and the proteins and soybeans were lower and the seeds were smaller. Roughly the same thing, maybe to a little bit greater degree. So that takes you to this year. Uh, this is the drought monitor picture compared uh, July 6th, right after 4th of July, and then the last one that was put up and we've seen that a couple of times. Uh, it has been growing, but it is not as severe nor the severity is as large in coverage as either of the previous droughts that we can, that at least we have uh, drought monitor records for. Uh, so one might not expect a much different response or even as strong a response as we had in, uh, in either of the previous two drought years that are in recent memory. We had one area of D3, a relatively small one, and uh, in Northwest Iowa. And this area of, uh, I think that's D2, uh, is, uh, it has been growing over the, over the season, but wasn't there earlier in the season. It's been gradually growing as rainfalls missed certain parts of the state. Well, that takes then, that takes me to, uh, what I'm not supposed to do, what I'm always wrong at doing, which is make a prediction of what we can expect this fall. It looks as though probably we will mature normally uh, with, with a normal black layer. Seeds are small. They've been, Aaron reported them uh, that in Southwest Iowa they were, that's not much different than other parts of the state. So I think we'll have small kernels, uh, probably not as well filled as we might normally have. And in the severe area, maybe some that actually will get far enough to the reduced test weight and, and, uh, and, and reduced composition uh, situation, but probably not over a great deal of the state. I, I believe we'll end up with relatively normal maturity even though yields are depressed. Shallower kernels, but smaller, thus no, not low test weight. We'll get, we'll, they'll fit in the cup and we'll get probably about what we would normally get for test weight. We could be more susceptible to yield and mold given the, the right, or should I say the wrong, conditions after Labor Day that we could get more susceptibility to mold in the field. And it might not always be aflatoxin. I'll get to that in just a sec here. Uh, I would Scott, I would do the, I believe we heard about the push test. Definitely, uh, I would do that uh, because we probably will have some hybrids that will be weaker in stock strength than others. And the prescription for those is ignore the moisture and harvest them. Uh, and take what you, you know, take the results of, uh, of drying and so forth. I would offer a caveat to that or a warning to that. If you do harvest early for stock strength reasons or whatever, please don't use slow drying because we will have a, an automatic tendency to feel mold of various types. And slow drying sometimes gets bit, especially when the air temperatures are, are reasonably warm, which they would be if you harvested in early mid September. And you could get mold growth in the in the bin. Uh, and that's not a that would not be what you want. Remember that uh, mycotoxins are a covered peril, that is, they're covered under your crop insurance. And Tim talked about your crop insurance at some length earlier. Uh, but they're a covered peril. But if anything happens, such as warm grain be aggravating the aflatox an aflatoxin problem in the bin, that's not covered. It is already harvested and it's not covered. So post-harvest management is important here. Get it dried as quickly as possible. The big key here is going to be the weather after Labor Day. 
um, and, and which way the weather goes, if it goes anyway. Actually, it doesn't look too bad. Um, if we have hot nights and a lot of dew and, and light moisture, that favors the Aspergillus flavus fungus. And, and, but at the same time, it will, to some extent, uh, favor rapid field dry down. But keeping a little moisture in the, in, in the stressed grain is what favors uh, field mold growth. That's something that you probably can't scout now. I would not figure you could get a good scouting until after Labor Day or so. Uh, to know whether you're, there is mold present in your in the field. If you do see it, Al Allison Robertson says, if you see it on 10% of the ears, take it out of the field. That Harvest it then, don't leave it stand. But on the other hand, if we get cool and wet, uh, if we'd happen to get cool and wet, I'll get to that in a minute, it doesn't look that likely, that, likely, uh, that favors vomitoxin or fumonisin, a, a fungi that like wetter, cooler weather, and slower dry down. Uh, for some of you that remember uh, remember crop years, remember 2009 when we were harvesting 23% corn at Thanksgiving, and we had a lot of moldy corn. So it, depend, it will depend a lot on what the weather will be after Labor Day, how the, how the drought and the, and the weather interacts and whether or not we have uh, mold in the field. The feed value should be, and I'm not talking about the nitri nitrate problem uh, at all, but the proteins ought to be okay. Probably not high, but okay. Um, and you can look down there. I put the latest three-month temperature outlook down there uh, for September, October, and November. You can see that on the temperature side, the chances are pointing towards warm. Uh, on the precipitation side, low. That actually could create a warm and pleasant situation, which again, like it did in the derecho year, kind of washed out the post-harvest problems, got the grain dry quickly, uh, but not enough to, and, and not enough heat to generate a lot of fungal growth. And so as a result, uh, we ended up with a very decent looking crop. And it could be that that will happen again this year given the given the weather outlook but it's all all about paying attention to the weather after when after labor day when we're in the late fill and then and then dry down period soybeans will be progressively smaller as the drought intensity in august uh, is higher they'll be progressively strong, smaller soybeans uh, okay beans until you get to the point where until or if it would get to the point where the soybeans would be killed before they would go to start turn yellow and, and be mature. At that point, uh, you, you tend to, the soybeans tend to produce chips where the beans were, and that becomes a processing problem. There is a great category for them, as a matter of fact, and it becomes a processing problem. Just small beans are not a processing problem, they're a yield problem, but but not so much, not a, a, a mechanical handling problem. We could have dry beans on green stalks, depends on when we get rains and when not. And that of course, of course creates a foreign material issue in, uh, in, in harvesting soybeans with the tough stock and, the, and, and still the beans mature. Expect the protein to be low and the oil to be high. And if the maturity is not, not reached, then we have could have both of them low because the starch hasn't or the and sugars have not converted uh, at that point. A long warm fall, on the other hand, if we were to get rain, that's not the forecast. But if we were to get rain, we could partially compensate for that protein problem and get a little bit more if the if the growing season were extended. So, in in all, I, I I'm not thinking that the, the crop quality situation will be desperate. Uh, we will be coming back with another report probably right after Labor Day to hone in a little bit more on what the specifics could be. Uh, if you want to hear, see, read 
this presentation and, and others on the grain quality situation, please follow the Grain Quality Initiative, which is there. And that also has our contact information, by the way, uh, on it. And of course, I always have to put a plug in for our feed mill con construction. That is also connected on our Grain Quality Initiative uh, page. Uh, it's 20,000 uh, ton a year commercial scale feed mill and, and grain bin setup, grain storage setup. It's the only comprehensive grain science facility usage and grain management that we know of in the United States that is, that is comprehensive with both aspects of the, of the grain storage problem. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll be bringing you updates on that as well as the grain quality situation as as the fall progresses. Thanks, Charlie. If anybody has questions for Charlie or any of our other speakers, uh, feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, and then also be sure to check out the resources that have been shared in the chat box as well. Um, one question we did get in um, during this meeting was um, if this meeting was being recorded, and it is, and we will be posting it later um, to find the link for it. If you just go back to the um, aep.iastate.edu website, the one that you went to to join this, we will have the link where you can access the recording for today's, uh, today's session as well. So with that, I'll check our chat box to see if we have any questions, um, but we greatly appreciate everybody who was able to join us today. Um, and if you do think of questions later, uh, feel free to reach out to any of the specialists. We are more than happy to help answer any questions that folks have. And at this time, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Um, so with that, uh, we'll end today's program. Uh, we greatly appreciate everybody joining us. And like I said, if anybody does come up with a question, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We're more than happy to help. Thanks.